Welcome to this episode of Mission Business, a podcast about good business for those in the business of good, presented by your part-time controller, LLC, also known as YPTC. My name is Jennifer Oliva, the host of Mission Business and managing partner at YPTC. In this episode, we are taking on a different subject, though no less important. I will be speaking with YPTC's own Geraldine Dressler, Director of Strategic Partnerships, who co-produces this podcast and hosts our Ask the Controller segment. She recently wrote an article that was published with the National Council of Nonprofits called A Storm is Brewing, The Accountant Shortage is Already Affecting Nonprofits. We wanted to dig into this topic more because it is already affecting the nonprofit sector and we have some advice on how nonprofits can weather the storm. A quick note before we begin. In this episode, we reference accountants and auditors, and we wanted to clarify the difference between the two roles. At YPTC, we serve as accountants. Accountants are responsible for an organization's day-to-day accounting transactions and preparing the financial statements, whereas auditors verify the accuracy of the financial statements to ensure compliance with generally accepted accounting standards. Accountants can be part of an organization's staff or external consultants like YPTC works with our nonprofit clients whereas auditors can only be external. Accounting happens year round, whereas auditing typically happens once per year. Today we have Gerilyn Dressler. We are so happy you're here today. Thanks for having me. Very important topic that we're gonna cover today, the accountant shortage in the nonprofit sector. Something we know a little bit about. Exactly. So um, you're getting a lot of traction on an article you just wrote uh, for the National Council of Nonprofits titled, A Storm is Brewing, The Accountant Shortage is Already Affecting Nonprofits. What's happening? Yeah, that is exactly what is happening. And we know this is happening because we have some data from the American Institute of CPAs, the AICPA. We love data. Um, and <laughs> We love data. And that's exactly what I'm starting <laughs> with here. And One of their uh, publications had a really staggering statistic, which was that 75% of CPAs met retirement age in 2020. And they did not exactly state what retirement age was, but I think we can figure in the 60 to 65 years old. The baby boomers, baby boomers. Yeah, Um, that's exactly it. There are a lot of accountants uh, in that range. (laughs) Yeah. And at, in the time that they were coming of age, going into a career in accounting was very mm-hmm. popular and attractive. And the other piece of what's happening now is that there are a lot of students who are not taking that same approach. There are fewer students that are completing a bachelor's or a master's degree in accounting. And I'll give you some numbers here real quick. In 2015, 80,000 students graduated each year with those degrees. And that was down to 73,000 in 2020. And then for those that went on to complete the actual CPA licensure and the exam, there's been a 33% decline between 2016 and 2021. So from a data perspective, we know what's happening, but we also have some other factors that we know. It's definitely a brewing storm uh, for all sectors, including our nonprofit sector. But what got us to the point that no one wants to go into accounting now? Not um, no one, though. Well, I, should, one, I should say not, not no nobody. one. There's a not lot of no people one. going into accounting, but there's a lot of <laughs> it's not as attractive as it used to be. Yeah. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about the 150 credit hour requirement. So back in 20, 2005, all of the states adopted this standardized requirement to be able to become a certified public accountant. And what that translates to is basically an extra year of school. And as we know how expensive a college education has become, when you add another year onto that, it makes it even more difficult. And for a lot of people, they would get that either by just staying and, you know, having figuring out how to pay for that, taking out loans, et cetera. A lot of people were trying to manage that by working at the same time. And I can tell you from experience, and I'm sure you have a similar one, studying for the CPA exam and working at the same time is very, very difficult, especially because going into the CPA profession, you know how hard the work is and how long the work is. And that's another barrier, I think, for a lot of students when they're making choices these days. They see the, the long work weeks, the busy season hours, et cetera. And it's not necessarily attractive to go and do that kind of work when they do have other options. Yeah. 
I was just going to say, you don't have to be a CPA necessarily to be an accountant and in the accounting profession. So there's other reason that people are not showing up for the profession. That's right. In fact, there was a really uh, prominent Wall Street Journal article back in December of 20, 2022 that had some additional data, because we <laughs> love data. And I'm going to quote here, more than 300,000 U.S. accountants and auditors have left their jobs in the past two years, a 17 percent decline. And the dwindling number of college students coming into the field can't fill the gap. And the article goes on to talk about recruiters who have been luring away experienced accountants into new roles, often in other finance and technology roles. Um, And that's really true because accountants have such a versatile skill set and the experience that they get in those entry level jobs really translates to so many different types of positions in really any kind of industry. Um, And then, of course, you know, the not cool factor, the bad rap. And you know as well as I do that. It's not true. (laughs) And I have to say, accounting is awesome. I love accounting. I want to draw more and more people into it. And the reason it is so great is that you get to see all aspects of business. If you're in a nonprofit, you get to see all aspects of the business of the nonprofit. And get to work with a, a mission based organization, which is and we'll get to a little bit more of that later. But typically as an accountant, you get to talk to everybody in the organization, all levels. Often you can be meeting with board members. You could be dealing with the CFO, the CEO of the organization. You can be working with all departments of the organization. So that's an accountant that works in an organization. But then you have the auditing profession. Listen, I was an auditor and so were you. I was with Arthur Anderson, you were with UI. And you know, we entered the profession because we thought it was a great learning opportunity. And you get to work in teams, you get to meet a lot of people, and you are automatically client facing when you're an auditor. You they put you right in front of clients. And it gives you a really great learning opportunity to talk to people, ask questions, exercise, curiosity, and and learn just about debits and credits as well as you're doing all of that. But right now, the auditing profession is getting a really bad rap because they're just still burning people out. That's why I left eventually. I stayed eight years. How long did you stay? I stayed eight years. Yeah. So we're loyal. (laughs) A lot of people leave after just a few years because there's just so much overtime, such long work, and there's not a a work-life balance, especially during busy season. And I believe if the auditing profession uh, would start paying people overtime, um, pay more people, hire more people, maybe some paraprofessionals to help out during busy season to truly give a work life balance uh, to to those in the auditing profession. It's it's tough. It is really tough to get people to to start that. But I, I don't want to diss auditors. I love auditors. Me auditors too. are our friend. Um, We work a lot with auditors at your part-time controller. Uh, We help them get ready for every audit that our clients have to go through and also help prepare information to help the auditors slash tax preparers prepare the 990s. It's a tough, tough business to be an auditor these days. There's also just so many, you mentioned before, so many other areas of accountancy. Um, There's tax, there's finance. Once you maybe practice as an accountant, you can get into management. I mean, look at both of us. We have gone down completely different path. We were doing the work at your part-time controller for a long time, helping clients directly with client service, and then took on different roles. You as our strategic partnerships director and myself as managing partner. But, you know, we, we've we both worn, worn a lot of hats at YPDC, like, you know, helping with sales, helping with uh, talent acquisition. And it uh, just a really great profession to enter and then, you know, go from there. I feel so prepared for the work that I do now because of the experience I, the experiences I had first as an auditor at EY and then serving our nonprofit clients for, you know, 12 of my 14 and a half years here at YPTC. So it's, you know, it it's good for the profession, but it's also not good because, again, I'm a perfect example, you too, you know, of people who have taken their accountant skills and then gone on to do other things. If you are interested in tech, but you're also interested in accounting, you should major in accounting. You yes. should go do, you know, go work as an accountant because you can always move into tech, but it's really hard to do it on the on the flip side. I would agree with that because uh, just learning the mechanics 
and the rules of accounting and the, how the theory of it all, too, is, is super important. But this isn't necessarily a commercial to bring in accountants in this podcast, but I think it's helpful for uh, our listeners to know about kind of how we got into accounting and why we think it's a great profession. So let's get into, you know, the nonprofit sector in particular and why uh, we think that and we know that the accounting shortage is really affecting nonprofit organizations. Yeah. And this really isn't a new thing. You know, nonprofits, they traditionally had a harder time attracting and retaining talent for many positions. And that is largely driven by capacity to pay competitive salaries. And that could be real or perceived, which is why nonprofits have also had to focus on some other ways to incentivize people. So, you know, excellent benefits, flexible work options, reduced hour work week, maybe even on-site daycare, and really just other quality of life friendly options. Um, to kind of supplement that lack of uh, the competitive salaries. Another kind of way that they can work on addressing that need of attracting and retaining really high quality uh, staff and really in particular accountants is to embrace technology. You know, people don't want to do boring work and they don't want to do repetitive tasks. And we know from our client work here at YPTC is that There's so much technology out there to help streamline processes and make our work more efficient. And when nonprofits invest in technology, or as we like to say in the business, their tech (laughs) stack, for example, you know, when the GL system talks to the payroll system and the donor management system, and then there's expense reimbursement and accounts payable, and they're all talking to each other. It's a really great opportunity to uh, allow those accountants to use their very smart brains to do that analytical work that leads their organizations to make sound decisions and future planning. And that's the type of thing that people want to do. They want to do analysis. They don't want to crunch the numbers. Enter things. (laughs) Yeah. They don't want to crunch the numbers. And that's, you know, I think that's the perception of accounting is like that we sit there and somehow crunch numbers, whatever that means. But it's really, it's that analysis. It's that thinking, it's that planning, that strategizing. That's the work that I loved doing with our clients. And I know that that's where they got the most value from from working with me. And so, you know, I I think that it's harder for nonprofits to take that leap to make those investments in technology. Obviously, funding is always an issue. But when you can use tech to think of it as part of Mm -hmm. your retention, attraction and retention strategies, it really takes on a different dynamic. And I think people really appreciate that investment. I mean, I think some of our clients find our services extremely valuable for all of the reasons you mentioned, because we're not just crunching numbers. We're trying to use technology to its utmost and then spend the majority of our time on the analysis. And I'm going to add to that in the relationship building with our clients and forming partnerships with them in their strategy in every tactic that they're making. They're, our clients are coming to us for all kinds of things other than just financial accounting items. It's uh, how are we going to improve our fundraising? How do we streamline this process? Um, how do I, <laughs> this is a good one, how do I better communicate the numbers or tell the story of the numbers to the board, to my funders? Uh, no, no. Uh, computer, no uh, chat GPT is going to give you the answer for that and help executive directors and board members really understand and trust the numbers and what they're saying and or have a partner they can rely on for all that type of advice. Those are all the reasons I wanted to go yes. into accounting. I wanted to you know, be that thought partner with, with clients. Yes. And it's a win-win, right? Because the clients get, you know, the nonprofits, they get exactly what they need to make decisions. And it's fulfilling work from Uh, from our perspective. Absolutely. And if nonprofits, like you said before, want to attract and retain uh, finance staff and all of their staff, they are going to have to develop and uh, really talk about and talk it up their great value proposition that they offer. Like, you know, YPTC, we offer a 35-hour work week. We pay for overtime auditors, but again, auditors are our friends. We love you. (laughs) We definitely offer true work-life integration. I I don't really call it balance because balance is, you know, that is always kind of in sync. 
And it never is. I don't know about you, because sometimes you're like running yeah. around and you, you have right. a lot of things going on in your personal life and work is not, you know, you're not spending 10 hours at your desk. Sometimes you're really, really busy at work and you're going to spend a longer time at your desk, but it's going to be integrated in your work and your life, especially as we're working from home now. And that brings on another great point is that people really want to work in either a hybrid or a remote environment. Uh, that is really, really clear from the data. I think LinkedIn just put out a big article about it. Uh, and especially age groups, uh, the younger set uh, want to work in a um, in a remote or hybrid environment. And that's that's a really interesting point there. And I've been I've been listening to a bunch of different podcasts that have talked about that point in particular. And I think it's really I think for any type of organization, but, you know, clearly for nonprofits, as we're talking about today, you know, there's never going to be a one size fits right. all approach to how people work. I think about how I started out at EY and you mm -hmm. as Anderson, you know, we were on these teams in our audit rooms on the premises of our clients and shenanigans <laughs> ensued when it got to be really late because you're tired and batty. And that was really fun, you know, despite the craziness. And it was a way to build relationships. And I think about the students who are graduating from college these days and they move into these remote type of positions. And where's their opportunity to develop those relationships? I, I think that's really, really hard. Yeah, I think for, you know, for, for nonprofits too, you know, I think there has to be an open-minded culture at organizations and recognizing that, you know, you've got older staff who are fine with commuting an hour and a half to get to the office, you know, before the pandemic. And now that is, you know, that's not going to happen in there. They've rearranged their lives to work, you know, remote. But then there are people who, for many reasons, don't want to work at home all the time and might want to come in. So I think having that flexible mindset and Agreed. embedding that into their culture and policies is going to be really important for that attraction and retention. Agreed. Staff. I mean, there's just some nonprofits that can offer remote in many cases, but I agree that flexibility, uh, strong mindset, and you mentioned culture. I mean, strong culture as relates to how you're going to set up your policies around remote work or hybrid work or working in the office. I think nonprofits have you know, an amazing opportunity to build up their culture and they can connect it so well to the mission that they're serving and uh, the work that they do every single day. And that could be a gigantic draw for many, many people. And especially for the younger generations, you know, having purpose for the work that they do. Absolutely. Is very, very high on the list. I work for a huge per percentage of my day of my life. What does that translate into for this world? And, you know, if you think about 20 somethings and they've grown up with so much uncertainty, they've grown up with climate change, mm -hmm. geopolitical instability, and they want to know that they can do something to make a difference. Yes. I think we in this sector, in the nonprofit sector, you know, we have that advantage because the work that we're doing yes. is inherently good. Yes. And so how do you go that extra mile, you know, to say like the mission is good, the work that we are doing for our communities is good. And we want to be that workplace of choice so yep. that you can feel fulfilled as well. Yeah. So that's some of the trade secrets of your part-time controller and how we attract people. Yeah. <laughs> We're telling it here on Mission Business Podcast. Exactly. I got a text message from a former client and friend and colleague, and she said, I just read your article. My finance director, who's been here for 25 years, is retiring, and now I'm freaking out. Oh, my gosh. So I said, don't freak out. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> so she, she is actually talking to us. But, you know, one of the benefits to outsourcing, you know, when you hire YPTC, you're getting the benefit of not just the person who's working directly with you, but the knowledge of all the other people who are there, too. <laughs> exactly. And you might have been comfortable doing something in your organization for 25 years, but things change. And I think it's harder for people that have been in an organization for a long time to keep that open mind to new technology, new way of doing things. And we kind of can bring that fresh perspective. And, you know, I have been in client situations where some I replaced someone who retired or resigned and they were there five days a week and I was able to do the work in, you know, one that to two days a week. Huge benefit. Um, and that I think is very common when we start working with different organizations. So yes. having that that fresh perspective is a really big benefit of outsourcing. And as we build trust with the executive director and go to board meetings, it's it's very helpful to have an outside party presenting the financials. It just gives the 
afford an extra set level of comfort. Um, not yeah, that we're absolutely. we're not auditors, uh, but it does uh, because it's we're not we're not an employee of the organization, uh, so we can really we don't get involved in the politics and things that might be going on, and we can really speak our mind uh, with uh, great truth. So yep. So speaking of auditors, I keep I keep bringing them up. I can't stop. Uh, <laughs> they are our friends. They it's are true. our friends. Every nonprofit, uh, at least at certain thresholds of uh, revenue and or expenses, are required to have an audit throughout the country. And if if they're not required to have an audit, most nonprofits are required to complete a nine ninety. So, with all of the shortage in the uh, of accountants, how are the audits going to be affected for nonprofits? Do you think in the nine ninety preparation? This is a big deal, um, and this is happening. We're seeing this all over the country right now. When there's a pipeline issue, when there's a shortage of accountants, you know, it all comes down to economics, right? Supply and demand. So in order to attract and retain talent, CPA firms have to offer much higher starting salaries. And in order to sustain those higher salaries, they're going to have to raise fees. So, you know, at a minimum, I think most nonprofits out there have probably seen some kind of significant increase in the prices that they're paying for either the audit or the review and the 990 as well. But the other piece of that, which is trickier, is that some uh, CP firms are actually dropping their nonprofit clients. Mm -hmm. And that is a side effect of, of this whole situation. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes down to, you know, capacity. You know, a lot of accountants are probably more overworked nowadays than they ever were before. And in order to retain their staff and not have them work 75 hours a week, 52 weeks out of the year, they have to make decisions about what types of clients they're going to keep on. And, you know, as we know, nonprofits have a harder time with their books and records and, you know, having clean financials in order to be prepared for that audit. And if it's too much work for an audit firm to go in and get that organization ready for the audit, they're not going to do it and they're going to drop mm -hmm. those organizations. And so they want, they're going to be following the highest, um, the highest revenue right. or the, the best right. quality they're, revenue. They're running a business, just, yeah. um, they're running a business and they're, they're figuring out the most choice clients to keep. And then that's right. That's what they and do. That we've had we've had clients come to us, you know, pretty soon or around the time that their field work was supposed to start and say, help, we need to find a new CPA firm to do our audit because ours just dropped us. And, that's the um, and it's really it's a really tough situation to be in. And then you're scrambling to get an RFP out and interview auditors because you really do have to do a decent amount of due diligence before you yeah. hire another audit firm. And, uh, Finance committee or the audit committee, technically, you should have an audit committee, should right. be involved in that selection. And you just can't just hire anybody. That's right. It's a process. So for many nonprofits, uh, having an audit or 990 is not an option. I mentioned that before. Like most nonprofits are subject to audit or 990. What can they do to help streamline the process? There are def there's some steps that nonprofits can definitely take. And the first thing I can think of is really sticking to the timeline that is agreed upon. So if you think about when you need your audit report by, work backwards and plan for that field work. And if possible, try to schedule that field work to occur outside of the CPA firm's typical busy season, yeah, which are idea. between the months of January and April. Most states and the IRS have extensions that are able to be filed for all of, you know, the required, like the 990 and, you know, with your state charitable organization. So have your auditor at least file those extensions to give you a little bit more time. And then you have to stick to that timeline. We have seen situations where the nonprofit just wasn't prepared to have the auditors come out and do their field work. And then the auditor said, sorry, you have to go to the end of the line because we are book solid and we need to keep to the schedule. And then that throws off reporting Everything. to, yeah, not just the government entities, but uh, funders. to funders, to bankers, yeah. you know, it, it has high reaching, you know, ramifications. So, you know, on that note, you want to make sure that your nonprofit is prepared. Every auditor is going to send out what's called a client assistance list or a PBC prepared by Little client list. PBCs. PBCs. Yeah, <laughs> we are very familiar with PBCs, made many of them in our days. But that is a great list that details out all of the things that the auditors anticipate needing at the outset. 
schedules, contracts, minutes, invoices. And you want to have that either all pulled and ready on paper. If it's an in-person visit, most uh, CPA firms use some kind of accounting portal. So you'll want to drop electronic copies into that portal ahead of time. And then also make sure that you have staff available to answer their questions. So just because they ask for 25 invoices doesn't mean that they're not going to ask for any more. So you want to make sure that people are available to be responsive so that when they say, and you plan for the field work being five days, that it actually takes five days and it doesn't take any, any longer. Another point is communication. And that should be fairly obvious, but not always because things happen during the year and an audit for most nonprofits is really just a once a year, a point in time type of situation. But if you have unusual transactions or, you know, you're talking about merging or there's some bigger picture things that are going on. Large make grants, sure, complicated yeah, large uh, grants. government grants, especially. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you are talking to your auditors and letting them know that this is coming because there might need to be additional disclosures that appear in the audited financial statements or might have to be a different way to recognize revenue or account for things. So. If you can avoid those surprises by being yep. communicative during the year, that will make the audit field work go a lot smoother. Another point um, <laughs> is for organizations to talk to funders. You know, that's something that I don't think is really happening right now. And in order for nonprofits to actually pay these higher audit fees or, you know, attract and retain their accounting staff, they need the money to do it. So they need to have frank conversations, especially funders mm -hmm. that require them to submit audited financial statements every year. They need to say, our audit is costing 50% more and we need your help in paying for that. Ask for the money. And Ask for the money. Also, if you're running late on your audit because the audit firm dropped you or yeah. they put you to the back of the line, talk to your funders about the timing of that. Don't let them be surprised that their audit is coming late. It's just really important to keep in communication. And if you're a funder, be proactive, have those conversations with your with your grantees. Again, especially if you're requiring a lot of financial statements on a regular basis, you know, is this is this been hard for you? How is this mm -hmm. going to impact your ability to deliver, you know, the financial statements Absolutely. on time? Um, and then similarly, you know, making sure that there is room in budgets and having conversations with your board so that they're all aware and that they see this coming and, you know, it doesn't come to the end of the year. And by the way, the audit fee was much higher than expected and nobody was prepared for it. Mm -hmm. What happens if uh, somebody up and leaves right before the audit, your accounting or your accounting staff and you're just unprepared? What would you do? Call Jen, your part-time controller? I would call your part-time controller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I, I was just going into like having your um, plan ready in case you do run into an emergency at any time, not just when, if you're right before the audit, but it just always seems like you're always running up against accounting deadlines. We have a deadline every single month, to prepare financial statements. We have budgets to prepare, grant reports to submit, forecasts to update. And it's really important for organizations to be prepared and have a backup plan. Uh, yeah. A succession plan for not just their executive director, but everyone in their organization, including their finance staff. Yeah. It's, you know, in the olden days, people had Rolodexes, right? And you had, <laughs> had you had names of people that could help you on in your Rolodex. Uh, Geraldine, but, you might you need know, to describe a Rolodex. <laughs> I never actually, I, I'm, I've seen them in movies, but I don't think I actually had one myself. I think it's round <laughs> and you can flip through different cards. Uh, but, you could also call it the who are you going to call list, right? Yes, so you, exactly. That's, that's part of that plan, too. I hope, as we've all learned from the years in this pandemic, that you have to expect the unexpected. And I think at the outset, you know, everybody was OK with mistakes and people not being prepared for things. But we've had some time. And there's an expectation that you have a backup plan. I think for everything that we do these days, there has to be a backup plan. And especially with your finance and accounting positions, you need to have yeah. your policies and procedures documented. Absolutely. We at YPTC, what we call it the win the lottery rule because hit by the bus rule is, is way too morbid. Yes. But if somebody just ups and leaves for whatever reason or they're sick or they're caring for somebody who's sick, you need to make sure that somebody else can come in behind, behind that person and pick up where they left off, including, you know, backup access to passwords and, and things like that. And... It should be clear to everybody in the organization. I worked with a bunch of clients where 
we also had a YPTC backup because I was the sole person handling mm-hmm. the, you know, the accounting information. And so every couple months I had a, a shadow from YPTC come and we would go through the procedures just to make sure that they could pick it up, you know, if something happened to me because the transactions were so sensitive and so important to the functioning of those organizations. Another huge reason to hire an outsourced accounting firm because you always have that backup and you have have the responsibility of all the management of the department, if you will, even if it's only just one person. Yeah. So this has been great. A lot of great information, a lot of fun. We should do this more often. (laughs) I agree. I was saying it's 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 very strange for me to be on the other side of this, I, uh, but definitely fun. <laughs> I think you were fantastic. And um also want to remind our audience that uh, to visit your part-time controllers website, the YPTC website, because there are so many resources there now. We have a plethora, I'm gonna use the word plethora of Good use. webinars. Uh and our our mission business podcast, uh, former episodes too, that we talk a lot about succession planning. And also we have an upcoming webinar regarding 990s and problems that you might see in that. Uh, We have webinars about audit preparation. We have webinars about QuickBooks and all types of information that's going to be so useful to any nonprofit. Great job with the article. Thank Uh, you. It's going viral. A little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Geraldine, thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me. That was my conversation with YVTC's own Geraldine Dressler, Director of Strategic Partnerships. I want to thank Geraldine for being a good sport and sitting on the other side of the microphone today. You can find the link to the article Geraldine wrote in the show notes and on our blog at YPTC.com. I want to thank the team at PWP Video for their guidance and assistance in the development and production of this podcast. They are a great partner for Media with a Mission, and you can find them at pwpvideo.com. Additional information about this episode can be found at missionbusinesspod.com. And follow us on social media at Mission Business Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Mission Biz Pod on Twitter. This podcast was produced by Erica Blair and Geraldine Dressler of your part-time controller, LLC. Dave Winston and Michael Schweizheimer are our producers from PWP Video, and the show was directed and edited by Pat Ganley. Again, I'm Jennifer Oliva, and we'll see you here next time on Mission Business Podcast, presented by your part-time controller, LLC.